I want to just say uh, at the onset tonight that um, while these teachings are basic, I think we could call them in, in some instances Prayer 101. I want you to know any successful team, any successful business, any successful organization only rem remains successful because they continue to do the basic, simple things well and all the time. Amen? And so I want you to know, as I was reading, and I'm still reading this book that I've taken a lot of our material from uh, for this course, I just want you to know God just stirred me up in my heart. And these are things that most uh, mature believers will know well. It's nothing new. But I think tonight the question is, am I applying it? Am I yielding myself to God and allowing God to use me effectively in my prayer time? And remember I said on the first week that the purpose of this is we're talking about in prayer, although it's, it's simple, basic stuff, we're talking about this prayer because we want to talk about praying to get results. How many of you know we don't want to just be praying to be praying? Amen? I want my prayer life to produce results in my life, in my church, in my community, in my family. Can you say amen? And so that's why sometimes it's good just to evaluate uh, some of these things. And I just want to take a minute tonight uh, to just read you a little introduction from a book that was just sent to me uh, via email uh, by W.E. Bounds, one of the greatest uh, men, especially uh, men of God, especially related to prayer. I just want to read his little introduction here, uh, if you can uh, just bear with me, because I think it, it just will um, reiterate uh, the point and the encouragement that we need. God's great plan for redemption of mankind is as much bound up to prayer for its prosperity and success as when the decree creating the movement was issued from the Father, bearing on its frontage the imperative, universal, and eternal condition. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession." In many places, an alarming state of things has come to pass in that many who are enrolled in our churches are not praying men and women. Many of these occupying prominent positions in church life are not praying people. It is greatly to, to, sorry, it is greatly to fear that much of the work of the church is being done by those who are perfect strangers to the closet. Small wonder that the works do not succeed and continue. While it may be true that many in the church say prayer, it is equally true that their praying is of a stereotyped order. Their prayer may be charged with sentiment, but they are tame, timid, and without fire or force. Even this sort of praying is done by a few straggling people to be found at prayer meetings. Those whose names are to be found bulking large in our great church assembly are not men and women noted for their praying habits. So I want you to know tonight a church that is going to be effective, a church that is going to experience the move of God, a church that is going to be cutting edge needs to be a church that is praying. And the only way to have a praying church is to have people in the church that are praying. Can you say amen? And <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And so I want you to know, not, not from a place of condemnation if you're not doing this, not from a place of, okay, I better start praying and it becomes a work, but out of a heart of love and a heart of, uh, of being led by the Holy Spirit, we need to uh, diligently pursue a lifestyle of prayer. Can you say amen? And that's really what the, the focus of, of this teaching and, and of us spending time together is really about. Throughout the Bible, we see God inviting man to call upon him. So God is the one who initiated prayer. And when we pray, we open the door for God to move in on situations. Can you say amen? So let's just recap quickly. In week one, we learned the first two most important things about prayer. Number one, we learned that when we pray, we ask the Father in the name of Jesus. Now, I know many of us know that truth, but it was amazing when we sat in the groups, how many people don't pray like that? 
Amen. And I want you to know, uh, you know, not to get dogmatic, but I want you to know we have a real enemy and we need to know our authority and we need to know scripturally how God wants us to do things. Number two, we said this, uh, the second most important thing about prayer is that when you pray, immediately you believe that you receive. Amen. Not the next day, the next week or the next month. The Bible says in Mark 11, when you pray, believe that you receive the things that you're praying for. Can you say amen? Very important. Number three, last week, uh, we saw the third most important thing about prayer is that I need to walk in an atmosphere and an attitude of forgiveness. And I want you to know that's a big thing. If, if we're living our lives and, and we're carrying offenses and we're carrying resentments and we're walking with this, with this unforgiveness in our hearts, it will be used by the enemy to hinder our prayers and to limit what God can do in our lives. And so that is so important that we continue to keep a forgiving attitude because then we can be assured that the answers to our prayers will be coming forth. Now, how many of you know, how many of you have ever had an unforgiving moment? Anybody here tonight? Okay, the rest of you will pray for your lying spirit afterwards. <laughs> how many of you know, all of us have had moments, and, and I don't know if you, if you have experienced this, maybe I think for different people it's different. There have been times where I've had to fight to forgive people. You know, especially when you've really been hurt in a situation, it's not just, oh, Lord, I forgive them and it's over. No, because your emotions are real. And sometimes there's a continual, Lord, I'm standing on the word that I proclaim that I've forgiven them. Amen. So you've got to fight for that. And I think that we've got to be real about these things. And then number four, um, the fourth thing we learned last week, the fourth most important thing about prayer, we learned the importance of learning to depend on the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that is so important tonight. And um, I can't remember exactly which scriptures we use, but can I just read Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17? I want to just highlight one or two things tonight. I'm reading out of the Amplified, and it says this, The Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. Isn't it wonderful tonight? Even if they removed the Bible from the world today and there was not another Bible left, you and I have the Spirit of God inside of us. And the Bible says the Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. Isn't that encouraging tonight? And that's what he's talking about. Then it goes on and it says, and if we are his children, then we are his heirs also. Say, I'm an heir to everything that Jesus purchased. As he is, so am I on this earth. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news tonight? And so we are heirs of God, and it says here, and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. I tell you what, you can be walking in darkness, and you know, you can be a believer and there can still be darkness around you. How many of you know that's true? Until the light goes on, until the word of God comes alive in your spirit, and suddenly the lights are switched on, and man, from that day, you will never walk in darkness again. Can you say amen? In that area of your life. And it's a progressive thing. So sharing his inheritance with him, only we must share his suffering if we are to share his glory. So how many of you know there's a time where we suffer in things because we're busy growing or we go? How many of you ever suffered some things? Come on, let's just be real. Let's be real in the church tonight. We all suffer things. Some of us are suffering right now. But here's the thing. We're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. and We're not going to stop. Can you say amen? We're going to keep trusting God and moving forward. So when you become born again, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. So therefore tonight, it's very easy for you and I to say that the Holy Spirit is living in your spirit. Amen? That's biblical. He communicates. Now, here's the important thing. If he's living in your spirit, where does he communicate with you? He communicates to your spirit. Because that's the, Proverbs 20 says, the heart of man is the candle of the Lord. Amen. And I believe God can give you thoughts. I believe God can speak to you through so many different things. But the primary way God speaks to the believer 
is by the Spirit in your spirit. Can you say amen? This is very important tonight. We're talking about the fourth most important thing in prayer, learning to depend on the Holy Spirit in prayer. All right, so we understand then that, that he speaks to our spirit, not to our head. So the inward voice of the Holy Spirit will not only help us to pray, but the inward voice of the Holy Spirit gives us direction. But sometimes our minds are so cluttered with everything else that we don't lean on that Holy Spirit direction. How many of you know that's true? Has your head ever been so cluttered with stuff, so stressed, trying to work everything out, that although there's an inward prompting, you don't respond to it, you don't lean on it? And that's what we're talking about, even in prayer tonight. You know, uh, when you're facing things, it's so easy just to go out and pray for the things. But the best thing to do is to not even pray for the things, but take a little bit of time, worship the Father. Take a little time, pray in the Holy Ghost and get sensitive inward to the prompting of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knows exactly how to pray the way that you ought to pray. Amen. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about depending, learning to depend on the Holy Spirit. We can be so over in the sense realm that our senses prevent us from receiving the wisdom of God or from allowing the wisdom of God to flow into our lives. And that's why it's so important for us to renew our minds to the word of God. Amen. I tell you what, I want to commend you for being here tonight and for being consistent on this course. And, you know, because if you get nothing else out of it, and I hope you get a lot because our, our prayer is that you're going to be revived in this time on this course. But if you get nothing else, you're renewing your mind to the word of God so that you can receive the inward direction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bump the person next to you and say, well done. Listen to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. All the, promise of, all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So how many of you can see from that, and we looked at it the first week, God wants the promises of, uh, of his word to become alive in your life because when they do, they glorify him. And he is the one who has established us with Christ, with you in Christ, and has anointed us. Who is it? God. Who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as our guarantee. Say, so depend on the Holy Spirit. The last part of that verse 24 says this. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are fellow workers for your joy and by faith you stand. I want you to know your faith today will get you through anything. It's by faith that you stand. All right, so let's move on then to number five tonight. We're going to talk about the fifth most important thing about prayer. And the fifth most important thing about prayer uh, is this. We need not only to depend on the Holy Spirit, but number five, we need the Holy Spirit's help in intercession and supplication. We need the Holy Spirit's assistance in intercession and in supplication. And now we're really taking this teaching a little bit deeper because I want you to know tonight, God didn't just call you to be a prayer person and to develop a lifestyle of prayer so that you can enjoy God. And how you know prayer is enjoying God and enjoying fellowship God, very important. Number two, God wants you to be a person of prayer so he can answer your prayers. Amen. But I want you to know God wants you to become a person of prayer and God wants you to get results in prayer because he wants to use you as a prayer warrior. Now listen carefully in the church. There is no such thing as the ministry of intercession. Have you ever heard someone, and I've said this at times, you know, I'm called to the ministry of intercession. No, there's no such ministry. Intercession is the ministry of helps. Listen carefully. And every believer is called to intercession. Amen. Now, there's some people who have given themselves to God 
yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit. And so God uses them in that gift of intercession. And that's why people sometimes say, you know, I'm called to the ministry. They're not, they're not using it incorrectly in that sense. But I wanted to highlight that because what happens when we say that, we think, okay, well, you know, Rob's called to intercession. I'm not. So we develop this thought pattern that I don't have to intercede. No, every believer, and you'll see from the word tonight, is called to intercession. He's called to make supplication. And you know what? If the church would get serious about that, you would be amazed at how things would start changing. Amen? Right. So let's just look at a couple of things here. Let's turn firstly and, and read Romans 8 verse 27. Let me just say again, I understand the ministry of intercession. I understand that in our own church, we've got a prayer team. And we've got people that are called, you know, that, that predominantly that is their ministry and their gifting. So I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is, remember tonight, every believer is called to this, uh, to this helps ministry. So I'm, uh, sorry, Romans 8 verse 27 says, says this. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of this Holy Spirit. I'm reading out of the Amplified. What his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints, according to and in harmony with God's will. Isn't that amazing? And the preceding verse says this, uh, you know, when you don't know what you should pray for as you ought to, how be it the Holy Spirit comes to your aid and he helps you. So we need this, the, the help of the Holy Spirit. So remember tonight, let me explain this, that the prayer of intercession is not prayed for yourself. You don't pray the prayer of intercession for yourself. The prayer of intercession is an intercessor, is someone who takes the place of another. So in other words, you don't intercede for yourself, but you intercede for somebody else. The word intercede actually means to stand in the gap for somebody else. And that's so important tonight as believers. If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to grow and mature in the things of God, you need to begin to move into this area and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit in praying for other people, praying for the church, praying for the leadership, praying as the Holy Spirit leads you. And we'll see some of that tonight. So to intercede actually means to act between two parties with the thought of reconciling one to the other. That's what intercession is tonight. It's the act between two parties with the thought of reconciling one to the other. In other words, if, if two parties need to be reconciled, it means that they are at loggerheads. <laughs> Something has come in that has separated them or prevented them. And so tonight, we need to realize, in other words, if they are at odds with each other, we would then intercede for the lost and for the backslider. Amen? You, you don't intercede for a born-again believer that's serving God and in fellowship with God. Because <laughs> they don't need to be reconciled to God. They are not at odds with God. Can you say amen? So the word intercede literally means to pray with the intent of reconciling. So the prayer of intercession is prayed for the lost or for the backslider. Why? Why do we intercede for the lost or for the backslider? So that they can be reconciled to God. How many people do you know today? If, if you can just show me by your hands. How many of you people know at least one person that's not saved? Okay. How many of you know of le at least one Christian that's backslidden? Okay, now I think we're probably about, I don't know, 40 people tonight. Imagine if we set a mission just to pray and intercede for those two people. And God answers our prayers. It means within the next week, month or year, depending how long it takes for them to respond to what you've prayed, we will have another 80 people in the church. That's how powerful intercession is, and that's how powerful prayer is. And um, I want you to know it's an amazing privilege 
to be able to intercede and pray and see someone who was lost getting saved. Now, we can get into the intricacies of that, and we might still do that later on in the course. Um, but for tonight, I just want to lay that out for you. Number two, the second thing is let's talk about supplication. All right, because we said these are the two areas we need the help of the Holy Spirit. And we need to, as believers, learn to yield and allow the Holy Spirit to help us in this area. Every believer can do this and should do this. The second one is in supplication. Now, the word supplication, if you study it, means the following. It means to make a humble entreaty or to implore God on someone's behalf. It means to entreat for, to ask humbly for, to be earnest about. So in other words, supplication would be made for saints who are already serving God but are going through stuff. How many of you have been through some stuff? <laughs> I had a friend this past week. I was on a, on a ministry trip in Cape Town. I had someone email and say to me, Pastor Larry, the Holy Spirit woke me up this morning and he, he asked me to pray for you and I just want you to know I've been praying for you and is everything okay? And I just want you to know I'm supporting you in prayer. I was like, wow, isn't that amazing? What was he doing? He wasn't interceding for me. He was making supplication. He was humbly entreating God on my behalf. And maybe there was something that I was facing or temptation or, or situation that was heavy. And so he was lifting my arms and he was making entreaty before God on my behalf. And I want you to know, not only is that a privilege, but I'm so grateful for people who would allow God to use them to pray for me because how many of you know we all weak we all have moments where, where we weak and where we can stumble and if it wasn't for the praying saints where would we be today so supplication is such a beautiful powerful tool of prayer to help other people as a matter of fact I believe this and I've learned this in my own life that one of the two most important keys for a pastor to pastor a good church is he needs to be an intercessor he needs to be a person who intercedes for the lost and the backslider and he needs to know how to make supplication for the saints because if you're praying for people you'll be amazed at what god will do <laughs> amen and so i hope i'm encouraging are you getting some help tonight are you glad you came all right by praying in the spirit in intercession what can sometimes happen is as you interceding for an unsaved person or, a, or for a backslider, you can be praying for a family member, you can be praying for a loved one, you can be uh, praying and, and, and asking God to help them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and God can even use you to pray for people that you've never met. Amen? You, you could just, you know, if you're just worshiping God and you're praying in tongues and then you just feel a drawing to start making, you could pray for an unsaved person in Timbuktu that you've never even met and God could send someone next week to that person and they could get saved. And you, in heaven one day, will get the reward. <laughs> hey, isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord. So that's why when, when we say, man, we can, we, we're do, not just going to preach to the gospel, preach the gospel here on the south coast, but we're going to preach it here and beyond. Can you say amen? Because if we'll be a praying church, we can touch people that we might never even meet until we get to heaven one day. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? And what a privilege. Because intercession is taking the place of another, what can sometimes happen, and, and there are people here that I know can share this with you, that what might even happen sometimes is you might even, in that intercession, start to feel the lost sense of the person you're praying for. Uh, you know, people have been known in intercession to take on that, the, the feeling and the sensing of what that other person is feeling and sensing as a lost person or as a backslider. Because what are you doing in intercession? You're taking the place of and entreating before God so that they can be delivered or set free and come to salvation. Isn't that amazing? Now, you don't always have to experience that, all right? Uh, but I want you to know it's possible. And as you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, it's a wonderful thing when God uses you uh, in that area. So yielding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit is biblical tonight. Can I say that again? Yielding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit is biblical 
And I want you to know it will bring much blessing to you and to other people. If you and I will just make a decision, let me not get ahead of myself. After praying in the Spirit a while, what will happen is you'll actually begin to discern whether you're praying in the Spirit as a means of building yourself up spiritually or whether you're praying in the Spirit, worshiping the Father or whether you're praying in the Spirit to intercede or whether you're praying in the Spirit to make supplication. And I want you to know you can help other people to victory if you'll just be sensitive and led by the Holy Spirit. We'll see some examples of that uh, a little bit later. So what, what are we saying here is that as you engage in this and as you start and as you make that decision just to be sensitive to the promptings and the help of the Holy Spirit in prayer, you can go deeper where you become so sensitive to your spirit and to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in and through you that you'll start to discern. You know what, I'm just praying in tongues now and I'm building myself up. Remember Jude 20, we'll look at this a little bit next week. Praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourself up on your most holy faith. When you pray in your heavenly language, you build your spirit up, you strengthen your faith. And you'll know, okay, I'm just praying in the spirit now, just building myself up. And then you might be praying in the spirit and you're like, oh, I'm just worshiping the Father. Amen. And, and we'll look at some things uh, in the weeks to come that will really uh, bless you and encourage you. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, at verses 1 and 3, and we'll see this here, uh, just read these three verses quickly. It says, therefore, I exhort first of all, Timothy, here, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy about the local churches. And look what he says to them in, in chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, I exhort, exhort first of all. So when must this happen? First of all, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Paul is talking to the church here. He's saying, listen, first of all, I want you to know that prayer, supplication, oh, sorry, he doesn't say that. Let me get it in the right order. He says, supplications, plural, prayers, plural, intercessions, plural, and giving of thanks, plural, be made for all men, for kings, for those in authority. And why does he want us to give that priority? So that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. I want you to know tonight, I want to encourage you tonight, you never have to be moved, worried or phased about anything that happens in your life, in your family, ever again, if you'll learn to give yourself to being a person of prayer. Because if you'll learn how to make supplication, if you'll learn how to intercede, if you'll learn how to offer up prayers, and if you'll learn how to live a life of thanksgiving, you'll be amazed at the blessing you'll bring to your life, to your family, to your church, and to your community. Bump the person next to you and say, be a person of prayer. Now, let me just clarify one or two things for you here, just, just to help you on your way. While intercession and supplication needs to be given priority, you can't just make intercession and supplication happen in specific areas or with relation to specific things unless it comes by the unction of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, what I'm saying there is, you know, you can, you can make prayers before God and, and talk to God about things and pray for things in the name of Jesus. And then you can say, Father, you know, I bring so-and-so to you and I know they're going through a difficult time and I'm just lifting them before you. That's making supplication. And then you've got to wait for the leadership and the unction of the Holy Spirit because he'll draw you in to intercession and supplication. Can you say amen? And, and so I'm talking about taking it a little bit deeper. And, and sometimes what happens is you'll get drawn by the leading of the Holy Spirit and by the unction of the Holy Spirit, and you'll go into that time of intercession and you're actually doing spiritual warfare. You're actually dealing with principalities and strongholds and things 
in those people's lives or in that situation related to people's lives that is actually binding up and stopping the victory from coming through. Can you say amen? Now, here's where you've got to be careful. You can't just go in and do spiritual warfare. Because what you do then is you do it in the flesh and it's not going to reap any results. So that's where we've got to learn to be sensitive and we've got to learn to be led by the Holy Spirit and learn to yield to the unction of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Amen. And that comes with time. It doesn't happen overnight, you know, but it's a process. And the more we do that, the more results we'll start to see in our lives. Amen. And I shared a little bit about, into, uh, by, about spiritual warfare on the first week, and we'll continue to do so uh, as, as we press into this. So in other words, what, what I'm really just trying to say to you tonight in regards to this, learning to depend on the Holy Spirit is such a vital, important key in prayer, because listen, by ourselves, we are helpless. <laughs> Amen? That's why we always remain humble before God. That's why we always seek God. That's why we always put God first, because without him, we are nothing, and we can do nothing. Can you say amen? And so that's why it's so great to be born again. Now, as we move on here, if you want to write something down on your notes here, and this is the crux of tonight's teaching, God is seeking those who will give themselves to pray. God is seeking those who will give themselves to pray. How many of you want to be that person tonight? You see, the devil will work over time at keeping us out of understanding these truths and applying them to our lives because if he keeps us out of them, he can keep us from enjoying the victory, enjoying the results. And I know what's, what some of us ask, because I've asked this. How come if Jesus died and he paid for everything and, he, and we are heirs and we've got all the promises, why do we have to pray? Because we've got a real enemy. <laughs> Amen? And that enemy is in the spiritual heavenlies just above us, and he wants to prevent us from walking in everything that God's got for you. That's the spiritual fight of faith that we fight. Can you say amen? And it's learning to pull those things down, if I can use that terminology, into the natural so that we can walk in them and we can experience them that makes the difference and people can start applying it and seeing it happening in their lives. We can clearly see then that those who don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues are really missing out on something especially in the area of prayer. Amen? But as we learn to give ourselves to these things, we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And here's the beautiful thing. We can become sharp and we can even begin to know things ahead of time so that we can pray effectively before things happen. John 16 verse 12 says, the Holy Spirit will come and he will show you things to come. Amen? Amen? When you start to practice and walk in these things and, 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 and they become part of your life, you become so sharp in the spirit, you'll pick up things and you'll know things and God can use you to intervene in situations that might not even happen. Can you say amen? Because you were a person of prayer. Isn't that beautiful? Praying for your children. Praying for your loved ones. Amen? And you, you don't even realize it, but you prevented a disaster from happening because you were keen in the spirit and sharp. Isn't that exciting? All right, let me give you an example quickly then, and then we'll, we'll get into our groups and we'll do our, our questionnaire. Uh, in Luke 2, verse 25 to 38, I'm just going to read a few verses here for you. We see the story of Simeon and Anna, and it says here in verse 25, And behold, there was a man, sorry, my, computer, my iPad's now decided to reboot. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was a just and devout person waiting for the consolation of, of Israel. Now listen carefully. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, because he couldn't be in him yet, okay? The Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? 
because he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit, because he gave himself to the things of God and prayer, the Holy Spirit had shared with him. Listen, isn't that powerful? There's no one else recorded in the Bible that got this promise. But Simeon, because he was a person who gave himself to prayer, the Holy Spirit revealed to him, you're not going to die until you see the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow. Listen, the story goes on. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple. What did he do? He came by the Spirit into the temple. So guess what? God was leading his life. And so he was led by the Holy Spirit to the temple, and guess what happened? He was led there on the day that Joseph and Mary walked in with Jesus to dedicate him. So when you led by the Holy Spirit, you'll be in the right place at the right time to see the right thing happening. Can you say amen? Isn't that encouraging? And so he came by the Holy Spirit, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him, listen, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God. I, I may be wrong here, because I, I don't, I'm not a historian, but it looks by this scripture that he was the first person outside of Mary and Joseph to hold Jesus. That's the privilege God gave him because he gave himself to prayer. And uh, it says he took, him, took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared, prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and glory. And so it goes on. Then we read on verse 36, just quickly. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. This woman was a widow of about 84 years old. Listen to this. She did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayer night and day. <laughs> what a woman of faith, 84 years old. Gave herself to fasting and prayer. Look what happened. Verse 38. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to those who looked for the redemption of Israel. She went from that place after seeing Jesus that day as they dedicated him. She went out and she started witnessing to everybody, telling them that Jesus had come. Isn't that beautiful? She was the first witness recorded in the Bible that went and told other people about Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Why? Because she gave herself to prayer. So here we have an incredible story. Two alone elderly people, two people almost completely invisible to the known world, but not invisible to God. They had authority with God. They, they, they got God's attention. Because they gave themselves to prayer. Isn't that a beautiful story? And because of that, although they were invisible to everyone else, except to the Holy Spirit, they had set themselves apart to God. The Holy Spirit was able to whisper to them, able to use them to pray in the Savior, and to be part of one of the, not one, part of the most important event in history. Because they gave themselves to prayer. So I believe that the Holy Spirit tonight is searching for those who will give themselves to this kind of prayer. Are you that person tonight? Are you that person who God can begin to trust with the burden of prayer? I believe if we'll become that person tonight, we'll be amazed at the blessing we can be to other people. Can you say amen?